Let us go to the Lord in prayer before we start. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we praise you and we thank you. We love you for who you are, Lord, for what you've done for us, for loving us when we were yet sinners, for coming after us before we even had a thought to go in your direction, Lord, before we believed. Lord, we also thank you for your word, for the instructions that you give us in how to live your, our lives. Lord, we thank you also for the warnings you give us about what's going to come in the future. Lord, I praise you and I thank you for each and every one of my brothers and sisters. Lord, not only here today, but worldwide, making up the corporate body of Christ. Lord, we pray for the persecuted church, undergoing various trials, persecution, and even martyrdom today. Lord, I pray that you be with them, to comfort them, to strengthen them, to guide them, provide for them, give them wisdom. And if possible, if they can flee from one city to the next, Lord, we pray that you allow that to be so. <coughs> Lord, I pray for your church at ease right now, Lord, that they not forget the God from whom all their blessings come from, the God who watched out for them, provide for them, that they not rest on their own laurels, but instead give you praise and thanks. Lord, we look to you. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, I just pray that you guide the message here, Lord, as it's not necessarily an easy topic for the church to hear. And I pray that you be with us in these days and times, and above all, help us to be alert and be ready. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Does everybody have a terms list? Yes? Good. Okay, so last week we looked at the first part of the Olivet Discourse. So this is Jesus' warning to a three-part question. When will these things be, meaning when's the temple, the Jerusalem compound, all that going to be destroyed? What's the sign of your coming? So in other words, when are you coming back? And then the third part, what's the end of the age? So we have the disciples asking the three. We looked at... The beginning of birth pangs, as Jesus called them. I'm going to be using the term specifically that Jesus himself uses. However, in modern day scholarship, theologians, they have come up with others, hence the term sheet. <laughs> so, the beginning of birth pangs. In the first eight verses, Jesus uses two sciences to describe what his coming is going to be like. Seismology which is the study of earthquakes and obstetrics, birth pangs, childbirth, childbearing. Now, for everybody in the room who is a mother, every single one of them I know of has looked forward to having a baby when they found they were pregnant. No mother, I have yet to meet one who looked forward to the birth pangs. <laughs> None. I've never seen that. So this is the two sciences that Jesus uses to describe his return. But I also want you not to miss the point. Who is he talking to? His disciples, believers, people who believe in him. We're going to emphasize this point a bit later, but there are a group of people who say this is not for believers. This is for unbelieving Israel or something. Excuse me, when has any unbeliever in a time of trial or doubt, decided, you know what, I think I'm going to pick up a New Testament. You know, no, let's do a Google search. Let's find out what my problem is. Let's, I'm going to go commiserate with my friends. Give me some sort of chemical to take. You know, you don't necessarily see, let's go look to the New Testament. Jesus is talking to his disciples. So on the terms list, when we get started here, because we're moving into the area of end times and Bible prophecy, there's four main areas that the Western church really looks at regarding end times prophecy. So if you look down under the additional terms and definitions, the second one in the row, preterism. So preterism, again, the prefix pre, this is the idea that what we're reading about in Matthew chapter 24 and if you follow full preterism in Matthew chapter 25, all of this happened in the 70 AD, as well as most of the entire book of Revelation. 
So a preterist viewpoint simply states that this is it. There's nothing else prophetically that's going to happen until someday the second coming miraculously happens. Everything all happened in the past. And again, there are people who believe this today. Historicism, the next one on the list. So this is the idea that there are ongoing fulfillments in history, especially in terms of seeing Rome and the Roman Catholic Church as a type of a new Babylon and the popes as a type of an antichrist, if you will. So the reformers, so these would be people like Martin Luther, John Calvin, others like that, and those who follow that, they would take this viewpoint. And with this viewpoint, they also would necessarily not look at Revelation or Matthew 24 as entirely literal. There's just this, this historical thing that's always going to be around until Christ comes back. The next one in the list, futurism. So this really began to get popularized um, in the 1800s and ramped up quite a bit to today. You also had this going back into the early church, but it fell out of favor around the 4th century AD. And this is the idea that most of Matthew 24 and 25, Revelation, Bible prophecy, relates to a future time that has not happened yet, something that we don't see a fulfillment of. And the last one is the idealist or symbolical view, sometimes called poemicism, but I prefer the idealist symbolical term. This is the idea that end times prophecy, where we're studying in Matthew 24, 25, Revelation are just poetic, symbolic. They're spiritual terms. They're meant to encourage the church through times of trial, persecution, and so forth. Don't look for anything literal out of this. It's just a symbol. It's just a metaphor. Most of the people, when they study end times, tend to want to fall into one of the four camps. If you were to sitting around with Jesus' apostles after Matthew 24, and you said, you know, um, which one of these is true? You know, Peter, James, John, Andrew, etc. Is preterism, historicism, futurism, idealist, symbolical true? Is there any truth? And what would they say, which, you know, which one's true? They would say all of them. <laughs> There's truth in all of them. If you're really doing a Bible study, if you're really looking at end times, a danger is to pick one of these views. And you heard me describe when we did Hebrews and some of these other Bible studies that I'm not a fan of systems. Once you pick a system and you get married to that system and somebody comes along and pokes a little hole in the balloon of that system, you have to shoehorn all the other verses to make that system work, which is why I don't like them. When we go through this section and the rest of Matthew, you have to allow the text to support what it can support. No more, no less. Like Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, do not exceed what's written. We're going to see types of all of this stuff, all four of these, if you read Bible prophecy. You can't get married to a system. Here's why. <clears throat> Jesus takes a shift as we begin in Matthew 24. But there's one other thing I want to discuss before that. You may have heard terms that people use to describe a rapture or the second coming, but especially the rapture. You may have heard terms like pre-tribulationalism, mid-tribulationalism, post-tribulationalism, pre-wrath, intraseal, some of these. These are relatively new terms. They are theological terms that have come up with over the past few centuries to describe a position on the rapture. Okay? But all of them are predicated on one supposition, no matter what position you take, if you're somewhere on that sliding scale. That supposition is before Jesus comes back, there is a final seven years of human history. How do we arrive at that? Before we hit Matthew, please turn with me to Daniel, the Hebrew prophet Daniel, chapter 9. This is how people get the final seven years.
And again, it's the basis of this is how you arrive at your rapture terminology. So Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. We have Daniel saying this prayer, and then Gabriel shows up to give him a prophecy. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Seventy weeks, literally 77, Shabuim in Hebrew, have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. So you are to know and discern from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be 70 weeks and 62 weeks, and it will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Then after 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. Notice this, the Messiah, our Christ, is going to be killed. And the people of the prince who is to come, notice we have a second prince, a rival, will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. And he, so this goes back to the nearest antecedent, the prince who is to come. And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wings of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction. One that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. We have Daniel's 70th week. People wonder, has there ever been, how do you, is that even a week? Does the Bible even support that? Matter of fact, it does. Real quickly, let's look at Genesis chapter 29, as Jacob is going to serve for his wife, Rachel. So, so Jacob is working for Rachel, and so in Genesis 29, and, but his father-in-law, Laban, deceives him and has him marry Leah first. So in verse 26, Laban says this to Jacob. Laban said, It is not the practice in our place to marry off the younger before the firstborn. Complete the weak, notice this, of this one, and we will give you the other also for the service which you shall serve with me for another seven years. So when Daniel is using this terminology of the sevens, he is picking the same thing with this week's terminology. It is not a new concept. But now we arrive at something else. Is there a gap in time between the 69th and the 70th week prophecy here? I posit that there is. <clears throat> In Luke chapter 4, Jesus quotes from Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2, but he stops in the middle of the verse. He does not quote the second half of the verse of Isaiah 61, verse 2, where it says the day of vengeance of our God, because his quotation, he's only fulfilling part of it at the first coming. The other part he fulfills at the second coming. <clears throat> okay. Let's look at another one. <clears throat> if you're still in Daniel, before we jump back to Matthew, turn to Zechariah, please. The Hebrew prophet Zechariah. This relating to the second coming, largely, if you read Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. <clears throat> Zechariah is another big prophet that has a lot to say about the second coming as we study Bible prophecy. So Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, it's God speaking. I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication, so that they will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, and they will beat bitterly over him like the bitter weeping of a firstborn. Notice it looks all one sentence, like there should be one prophecy, correct? One prophecy. Turn with me, please, to the Gospel of John, chapter 9. I'm sorry, 19, rather, 19.
Jesus is on the cross in John chapter 19, verse 37. Notice John the Apostle, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, only quotes part of Zechariah chapter 12 in verse 37, where John says, and again another scripture says, they will look on him who they pierced. John the Apostle is saying you have a partial fulfillment here. He does not quote the entirety. Now this same John the Apostle, turn with me to the book of Revelation, please, chapter 1. Verse 7. Same John the Apostle. Behold, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over it. So it is to be. Amen. When is the second half of Zechariah 12 fulfilled? The second coming. There is a gap in time. Just like there is a gap in time between Daniel's 69th and 70th week. This is how they arrive at these positions. With all that as background, let's jump back to Matthew chapter 24, please, as we go to deal with what Jesus talks about. We're looking at the tribulation, the abomination of desolation, and the great tribulation. <laughs> Again, fun times, fun times. So Matthew chapter 24, as Jesus continues with the Olivet Discourse, verses 9 through 14, but then... They will deliver you. Notice there's two groups of people, the they and the you. The you are obviously the disciples, and by extension and incorporation, all of us as believers. Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. At that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and mislead many. Because lawlessness has increased, most people's love will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. On the terms list, this word for tribulation, glipses in Greek, glipses. Notice Jesus says, who's going into tribulation? Is it the world or is it specifically his believers? It's specifically his believers. This word is used 45 times in the New Testament, ellipses. Almost each and every single time, it is speaking of something the believers have to face. Let's turn to a couple right now. <clears throat> Let's look at Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, verse 3. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. Notice Paul says, we as believers will experience this stuff. If you take a pre-tribulational situation here where you think that the church will not be around for this, they will rightly point out something the church doesn't experience. We're in Romans chapter 5, verse 3. Just jump ahead to verse 9 in Romans 5. So much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Notice one believer's experience, two, the second one, they do not. God makes a distinction. The believers will never experience the wrath of God, but always, up until the end, will experience tribulation. Let's look ahead at verse Thessalonians, please. I promise we're not going to be jumping around all the rest of today, but 
It's, I think it's important that you see these because we're dot connecting here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Verse 6. So Paul, writing to the church at Thessalonica, you also became imitators of us and the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation. Notice there's that term again. With the joy of the Holy Spirit. Notice they had a joy in the Holy Spirit in tribulation. So again, the believers experienced tribulation. But let's look ahead to verse 10 of the very same chapter. The same Paul the Apostle says, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. That word wrath on the definition sheet, or gay, we're going to deal with that later. But notice, one, believers don't experience, but the other, believers always have experienced. Jesus himself said in the Gospel of John, chapter 16, verse 33, in this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Believers experience this, and we need to know that. If you take a pre-tribulational position, my question to you is, if Jesus is warning about this, and Paul the Apostle, John the Apostle are saying, this is something believers experience, how do we get a get-out-of-jail-free card? I, it doesn't compute. But again, if you take a pre-tribulational position of the rapture, that is fine. I just want the questions answered. And I hope that when I discuss where I land on this issue, that you'd be willing to question me on things you don't make, think make sense. Iron sharpens iron. It's a point of discussion, not for division. Not something you disfellowship over. It hasn't happened yet. But there's a problem. Why the tribulation directed at the believers? First Peter tells us. First Peter chapter 4, verse 17, he says, Judgment begins where? At the house of God. That's where it starts. God's concerned about his own children. He's going to deal with them first before he deals with the children of the God of this world, the devil. Judgment begins here. And he says, they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you. And you will be hated by all nations because of my name. At that time, many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. Philipses. Notice, when the bad times happen and believers start experiencing these things, a number of them will fall away again. Like I said earlier, no mother looks forward to labor pains. No believer in their right mind looks forward to persecution, trial, martyrdom, being hated by people. No believer in their right mind wants that. When that begins to happen, think back to the parable of the sower and the seed. Jesus said, when the enemy comes and persecution hits, what happens? Same word, philipses. That's the other time Jesus uses that word. They fall away. Many will fall away. There's going to be a massive apostasy that takes place. But there's a, two sides to this coin. Persecution is one side. Here's the second side, verse 11. So after the betrayal, verse 11, many false prophets will arise and mislead many. Notice, many. In the book of Revelation, everyone wants to center on, well, there's an antichrist and there's a false prophet. There's one or the other, as if they're all wearing some sort of superhero costume that says antichrist and you can pick it out. No, <laughs> there's many. It's not going to be that easy to pick out who these two are in the beginning. So you have a, a double-sided attack. Notice Satan, how he works. He's described as a serpent and a dragon. All right? The serpent is the seducer. He deceived Eve. He got Adam and them to sin. He seduces people through false doctrine and so forth. He will use these false prophets to try to seduce believers away from the faith. 
On the other hand, if you're not going to be seduced away, the dragon, the persecution, the one who prowls about like a roaring lion seeking who he can devour, it's a two-sided attack, and it's amping up. And remember, the beginning of birth pangs, all the other stuff has happened, the war, the famine, the pestilence. Verse 13, the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. So if you take a post-tribulational side of viewpoints, this is one of the verses you're going to look at. So we have to dig deeper into Matthew 24 in the future to see if that's what Jesus is hinting at here. And the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world for a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. This relates to something that Paul calls the fullness of the Gentiles in Romans chapter 11, verses 25 through 27. Notice all the nations. Tertullian in the second century, as persecutions were happening under the Roman emperors at that point, he said the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. The more the church was persecuted, even heavily, prior to Constantine's arrival, before the Edict of Toleration in Milan, around 312 AD, the persecution was the hardest and the heaviest, and yet the church kept growing, and they couldn't figure out why. This gospel of the kingdom is going to be preached to the whole nation as a testimony to come. God's word does not return void. Okay, this is the final missionary push of the church. Notice what Jesus says, though. The gospel of the kingdom will be preached. It's going to be preached. Does that mean the world is going to accept it? No. No. Individuals will accept it. What does God tell Ezekiel before the fall of the temple in AD, I'm sorry, BC 586? Tell the many for the sake of the few. What does he tell us for the church? Tell the many for the sake of the few. One is a picture of the other. That temple came down at 586 BC. What's the temple now? The church. That temple is going to be coming down in a bit, and God wants us to be ready for that. Again, think of Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Go out and be my witnesses <laughs> to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth, the final missionary push of the church. If you take a pre-tribulational position and you want to say this is the work of the 144,000 of Revelation 7 or the two witnesses of Revelation 11, I would suggest that you go back and read those chapters and see if you can find any hint that they evangelize. I have yet to see that. That is a speculation based off of a system. And again, what can this text support? That's the tribulation. Things get worse. Let's look at verses 15 through 21. Then Jesus says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Whoever is on the housetop must not go down to get the things that are out of his house. Whoever is in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. But pray that your flight will not be in the winter or on a Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Okay. On the basis of just this segment is how some people in systems will extrapolate the entire rest of Matthew 24 and say this only applies to unbelieving Jews because of the geographical regions mentioned and the general Jewishness of the tone of these six verses. But think back to the original question, when will these things be? 70 AD comes into play with part of this, as well as a future thing. Again, you think of the preterist viewpoint here, when they say all this happened already, notice what Jesus says in verse 15, when you see the abomination of desolation. All right, I apologize, we have a page flipped to go. Please go back to Matthew chapter, or I'm sorry, Daniel chapter 9. 
we've got to look at what Daniel says about this guy because Matthew specifically says, let the reader understand. He makes an editorial comment where he wants us to understand what Daniel said. So looking back at Daniel 9.27, where we're first looking at this mention of the abomination of desolation, Daniel mentions it three times. Verse 27, so he, so again, we're dealing with the prince who is to come, will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. And in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to the sacrifice and the grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. So notice somewhere around the halfway point, three and a half years. Jump ahead, please, to Daniel chapter 11. We'll look at verses 29 through 35. And we're not going to spend much time here other than to mention the abomination and desolation part. This has a past fulfillment under a character named Antiochus Epiphanes IV. Daniel chapter 11, verse 29 through 35. At the appointed time, he will return and come into the south. But this last time, it will not turn out the way it did before. For shits from Katim, so this would be Cyprus or Rome, will come against him. Therefore, he will be disheartened and will return and become enraged at the Holy Covenant and take action. So he will come back and show regard for those who forsake the Holy Covenant. In other words, you want to leave the faith behind. Forces from him will arise, desecrate the sanctuary fortress, and do away with the regular sacrifice, and they will set up the abomination of desolation. By smooth words, he will turn to godlessness those who act wickedly toward the covenant. But the people who know their God will display strength and take action. Those who have insight among the people will give understanding to the many, yet they will fall by sword and by flame, by captivity and by plunder for many days. Now when they fall, they will be granted a little help, and many will join with them in hypocrisy. Some of those who have insight will fall in order to refine, purge, and make them pure until the end time, because it is still to come at the appointed time. This guy, from roughly around 171-ish to 168 BC through to 165, he is, comes from... <clears throat> one of descendant of one of Alexander the Great's four generals, okay, who has taken over this area. He puts a stop to the Jewish faith, executes the high priest at that time, and then he sets up a symbol. He puts a statue of the Greek god Zeus on the altar of the Jews, but he takes the statue's head off and puts a mold of his own head on there and then sacrifices a pig on the altar that they have, and he takes the statue up saying, I'm God. You have a man going inside the temple, offering an unclean animal, declaring himself to be God and demanding worship. The abomination of desolation in God's temple. Okay? Do you have a man proclaiming himself to be God, demanding worship as God in the temple of God? What is the temple now? All of us. What's going to happen when you have a man who comes back proclaiming himself later on to be God and demanding to be worshipped as God? And just like Antiochus Epiphanes, it's a death sentence if you refuse to do that. There will be people pretending to be Christian or others who fall away worshipping a false God instead of the true God the abomination of desolation. God will not give his glory to another. Does that make sense? There will be potentially another temple on the Temple Mount next to the mosque of Omar. I allow for that. But don't forget the real meaning. Seven times in the New Testament, the church is called the temple. What Antiochus Epiphanes did and notice, some who had insight will fall. You have internal conflicts. People join with them in hypocrisy. Many will fall away and betray one another. What happened in those days that Daniel told about, Jesus is saying, it's going to happen again. Remember that? 
We know Jesus knew this happened because he celebrated Hanukkah in John chapter 10, the Feast of Dedication, when the Maccabees were able to take the temple back. He took a past event and he said it's going to happen in the future. 70 AD, again, whoever's on the housetop, don't go down and get the things in the house. Whoever is in the field, do not turn back and get his cloak. Woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. Pray for your flight to not be in the winter on a Sabbath and so forth. Okay, even to this day, for people who have visited Israel, they have Sabbath things where the elevator only goes up so far. You can only travel so far. You can only do so much. In the time of the Maccabean War under Antiochus Epiphanes, one of the reasons he slaughtered so many of them is because the Jews refused to fight on the Sabbath. All he had to do was wait it out until that day and then just go ahead and massacre them. Okay? Clever military tactic on his part. But 70 AD, you have this going on. Even believers still would be observant as a testimony to the non-believing Jews. But what happened? Luke gives a further detail. He said, when you see Jerusalem surrounded, after the martyrdom of Jesus' half-brother James, a cousin of his named Simeon took over as the lead pastor in Jerusalem from 66 AD-ish onward when James was martyred. Okay? The Roman general Titus and his forces are besieging Jerusalem. When Galba dies, Titus' father Vespasian has to go do with something. So Titus and his forces inexplicably withdraw from Jerusalem. Simeon and the believers escape. Notice there was a rescue for believers. They fled to a place called Pella. Who was left behind when Titus and his forces came back before the temple was destroyed? The non-believing. Josephus records awful, monstrous things about those days. Mothers giving birth to children so the families would have something to eat, including the afterbirth and other horrific things and details in his books, Wars of the Jews. It's a very dark time. What does Jesus say now in verse 21? For then there will be a great tribulation, such as not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Megalopolipses. Great tribulation. As bad as 70 AD was, remember, for the believing church, the Roman government picked two kinds of religion, religio licita and religio illicita, a licensed and an unlicensed religion. One was okay with the emperor, who also demanded to be worshipped as God, by the way, starting again with Caesar Augustus, formerly Octavian, but it continued. The believers were getting to be unlicensed. In other words, you're not okay. It's all right to start persecuting you. But the Jews, on the other hand, Titus, and as monstrous as this was in the fall of Jerusalem, that's 70 AD. Notice what Jesus says here, though, with the Great Tribulation. Nothing like this will ever happen before. Well, far worse things have happened to both Jews and the church since 70 AD. All right? <laughs> think, you know, again, of the Jews. Just think of last century. All right? The Holocaust. Far worse things have died. You know, they, what was it? A third of the, of the entire world's Europe, um, Jewry population died in the Holocaust of World War II. Two thirds of Europe's Jewry. <laughs> That's a lot. Now, for the church, the 20th century, with the rise of Islam and the militant stuff, atheistic nations, the communism and stuff of, of Stalin, Kim Dynasty in uh, North Korea, Pol Pot, many of these others that have come up in the 20th century, more Christians have died for their faith the last century than the previous 19 combined. And Jesus says, this time, when it happens, is going to be worse. There will be great tribulation. So let's look at the final segment. Matthew chapter 24, verses 22 through 28. Also notice, 
in verse 21 before we get there. The beginning of the world until now, this great tribulation, everybody gets affected. <laughs> this isn't just about the church anymore. Everyone gets affected. Verse 22, though, unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then if anyone says to you, behold, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe him. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders, so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told you in advance. So if they say to you, Behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. Or behold, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe them. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will this coming of the Son of Man be. Going back to verse 22, the start of the great tribulation. So we go from thalipses to megalipses. Unless those days have been cut short. If you look at the terms list under Matthew 24, you're going to see that word cut short. That Greek word is kolobo. It means to curtail, to cut short, to amputate, to shorten. Okay? Unless those days have been cut short. But on whose behalf are the days being cut short for? The elect. Eklektos in Greek. The elect, the believers. Okay? The days will be cut short on behalf of the believers. There's an amputation coming. God has a rescue plan. Think again of birth pangs. All right? The closer the woman comes to giving birth in the labor, the baby is almost cheer. Oh no, there's a complication in the pregnancy. We've got to do something different. Time to have a C-section to get the baby out that way. God has a rescue plan coming. A massive C-section called the rapture. Okay? That's going to be coming up in the future. For the elect's sake, this is going to be cut short. But God in his mercy, if you look ahead at the book of Revelation, you're going to even see after the believers are removed out and his wrath is being poured out on the world, in Revelation chapter 8, it would appear your 24-hour days get cut by a third to 16-hour days, which is very interesting. But for the elect, these days will be cut short. And notice he says no life would be saved. In other words, if this was allowed to go on, rampant, unmitigated, without a stop. Nobody's going to be alive by the end of it. So we have a rescue coming. Then Jesus says, if anyone says to you, behold, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe him. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders. Notice what they're going to do. Miracles. Signs, wonders, Jesus says, if possible, to mislead even the elect. Signs and wonders are never the key to belief. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Notice how many signs Jesus performed throughout the Gospels and how many did not believe, but they just kept saying, show me another sign, show me another sign, show me another proof. Signs and wonders you cannot go after. Behold, I told you in advance, this stuff is coming. Be ready. He's in the inner rooms. Don't believe them. This is another issue here. Jesus' return is not going to be a secret, Psst, hey, I'm over here. It's very public. <laughs> when he comes back, everyone's going to know. When you think of things like the rapture, for example, how dumb do you think the world is? When people usually present this, they want to say that it's going to be some sort of secret event that is going to confuse the whole world and everyone's not going to know what's going on, but the Antichrist is somehow going to have an explanation or the New Agers might or somebody. <laughs> Will Google go away when this happens? Will the New Testaments all vanish when this happens? No. Hollywood is already mocking us for this. They have TV shows like The Leftovers and stuff like that. Or as Matt was telling me earlier, 
after the rapture happens, the pet care service for the pets left behind. They mock us. <laughs> Beam me up, Scotty, Star Trek. You know, that's how you want to do this? The world mocks this. But when it happens, do you think they're not going to know what it is? No, they will know. That's the whole point. The only people who think that the world is not going to know is if you subscribe to a system that believes in a somehow a secret removal. It's going to be very public. They're going to know. We're going to get to that next week. Okay, we have a, another verse, though. The lightning flashes from the east even to the west. This is a possible allusion to Psalm chapter 97, if you're taking notes. God there talks a bit about his judgment and the sign of the lightning and so forth. But verse 28, wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Now, John Calvin and some of the other reformers decided they thought this was a picture of believers feeding on Christ. Uh, I don't think the church is ever described as a carry-on bird. <laughs> And a corpse, really? Think of the first coming where Jesus was at, okay? As he goes to the cross, the disciples are with him. He tells them that this is going to happen in a short bit. All right? What happens when he goes off to pray? They fall asleep. They can't even stay up with him as he's turned over, handed over to the Gentiles. They fall away, so to speak, in figure. One betrays him into the hand of the Gentiles. Then the shepherd gets struck, the sheep are scattered. All right? It's night when this happens. One is a picture of the other. A is to B, B is to C. Did this happen to the apostles right away that Jesus is describing here? No. In Matthew chapter 10, when he sent them out in pairs and warned them, did he say, you know, all this stuff's going to happen? Did it happen to them then? No. But it starts to happen a few decades later in the book of Acts, and it keeps happening all the way until he comes back. The people get scattered. The vultures, the carrion birds. Again, the Greek word atos, okay? Some people will want to look at this and think of the Roman legionnaire eagles from Titus when they stormed Jerusalem in 70 AD. That may be, maybe, but the problem is the eagle is not normally a carrion bird. It does not feed on the flesh of a dead body. So what are we looking at here? Let's roadmap this to Revelation chapter 6, please. Like we did last week with the beginning of bird pangs. Now we have to roadmap to see where we're looking at. Revelation chapter 6. So the beginning of the bird pangs, we mapped it to the first four seals. Now let's roadmap to this next one. Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 24. You fall away, betray one another. And this will go out as a testimony to the nations. Verse 10, And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, Will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And there was given to each of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest for a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed even as they had been would be completed also. The vultures are gathering. Now, a lot of times in the wild when animals go off to die, okay, unless they're hit by a car or something tragic or a predator takes them, when they know they're about to die, they tend to wander off alone, okay? When that happens, and vultures or other carrion creatures come down to eat them, 
You see the carcass there. You might not know how they died, but you know a death had taken place. The vultures are there. But Daniel calls the shattering of the power of the holy people what Paul calls the restrainer being taken out, if you will, some of these other things that are going to happen. The church is in a point where the apostles were in the 10-day period from the time of Jesus' ascension to the time of Pentecost. Okay, They were alone, powerless, hiding in an upper room. Jesus said, you know, I'm not coming back except the way I came. You go out and you preach. But there were 10 days before Pentecost and the Holy Spirit was outpoured upon them where they were afraid, hiding in an upper room. The vultures are circling around the church at this point. The Holy Jesus went away to send the church the Holy Spirit. You almost have a reversal that's going to happen here in a loose sense where the Holy Spirit is going to go and send Jesus back. Come back, get your church. So again, many will fall away. Many will betray one another. They will hate you. All nations will hate you. But at the same time, the gospel of the kingdom goes out to the whole nation. The love of many will grow cold. Think of this. If you are standing on a rapture timing, for example, or a other subject of the Bible that is not what Jude calls the faith once delivered for all the saints. If you're picking a minor and standing on that, and you start to disfellowship with other believers because they don't stand with the point, your love is growing cold. What does the writer of Hebrews say that he's so warning about? Unbelief, don't fall away. What does Jesus say? Don't fall away. We think of the song, and they'll know we're Christians by our rapture timing. <laughs> no, that comes straight from 1 John. They'll know we're Christians by our love. Love for the brethren, love for each other cannot stop in this time. He is warning, don't let your love grow cold in the midst of this tribulation, the midst of the trial. This affects the whole world. The psalmist says, there will be fear and anxiety among the nations, none of them knowing the way out. Much like Caesar Nero in the end of this time, blame it on the Christians. Let's go after them. He kills Peter. He kills Paul. Starts martyring the rest of them before he himself is dead. The vultures are circling. Things are getting dark. The church is saying in the fifth seal, Oh Lord, how long until you judge? What's going on? And then finally God is like, Enough. This has gone too far. And then that is where we pick up next week. The rapture, the second coming, the judgment, the parable of the fig tree, the other trees. What does Jesus mean when this generation will not pass away? Things are getting dark. Jesus understands that. Notice the metaphor God uses for his judgment on the world. The wine cup of the wrath of God. It's slowly filling up but it's going to get to a point where the Father says, that's it. My servants who will not experience it are removed, and the rest of you who tortured them, who killed them, who persecuted them, you get what's coming. It's not an easy message. Tribulation, the abomination of desolation, the great tribulation. Not fun for the church to have to think about what to go through, but Jesus said, behold, I told you in advance. I told you in advance, we have to be ready. We have to have love. We have to be there for each other. We have to encourage, strengthen, support. I told you in advance. I love you. I want you to know this. Don't be caught off guard. Be alert. But a rescue is coming. Next week, we look at the rescue. The rapture, the second coming. Amen? Be encouraged. In Luke's gospel, right before he talks about this, if you look at Luke 21, right after this dark time, Luke records Jesus saying, when you see these things begin to happen, look up, your redemption draws nigh. Please think of that, my brothers and sisters. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right.